So our speakers today um, are Lucy Toure, uh, we have Aline Lam, and we have Alejandra uh, from ProDesk, who is, who is also joining us. Um, and we have two questions that we will discuss with the speakers, and we will uh, later invite, uh, we'll also invite folks to, to join the conversation through the comments, uh, sorry, not through the comments, but rather through the chat. We'll ask you to post your questions, uh, your comments in the chat um, as, as the speakers are, are, are talking. And then we'll have a moment after the speakers to, to reflect on those questions and comments. So um, I'll begin with uh, introducing our first speaker and that's Lucy. Uh, Lucy is a Sierra Leonean activist and an advocate for the rights of migrant domestic workers. Uh, she's a former migrant worker herself who returned uh, to her home country due to the difficult conditions faced by migrant workers in Lebanon as a result of the economic crisis there. Um, and Lucy is currently the founder and director of the Domestic Workers Advocacy Network, which is a feminist organization based in Sierra Leone, where she works to raise awareness about the kafala system in Lebanon, as well as to empower women and to support their path to self-reliance. So um, the first question I have for Lucy and for our speakers today is, as feminists, what changes do we want to see in the arena of labor migration? So I think we started talking a bit about this in our uh, groups, but we also thought about this in our visioning exercise. Uh, do we have examples of where this is already happening? And I want our speakers to also share the example of the organizations that they are also leading, have founded and are working with to give us uh, some some, some examples of, of changes that we're actually seeing. So Lucy, uh, if you're ready, I will hand you the floor. Let me just quickly check to see that Lucy is with us. I think she got... She might've gotten disconnected. Oh, okay, we're here. No. Hi, everyone. My name is Lucy. No, I got the first question. Um, okay. Lucy, I think we are having some trouble hearing you. Maybe you can turn off video to make the audio a little bit better. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, I'm from Sierra Leone. Now, the first question is that what change do we want, and how do we want to see the feminists in migration? First of all, the first change that I want is to abolish the kafala system. Because actually, in most of the Asian countries, they live by class. Like they have the first class, the second class, and the third class. Actually, we domestic workers, we found ourselves in a low class where we look like a low human or low human being. Like we are not human beings at all because of sexual ways, violence, human rights abuses, sexual physical. physical and verbal abuses. And it also leads to mental disorders for young women. And also sometimes it leads to death. But at the end of the day, there is no justice for migrant domestic workers. So this is the first thing that we should look at. I'm saying like as a feminist, we when we stand up together, that system, the second one, we want to see that we got empowered because of lack of empowerment that 
in that little highway of human trafficking. And human trafficking greed as a result of all these things that I've just mentioned, gender-based violence, human rights abuse, sexual abuse. So has the feminist. We think that if we empower in ourselves, in our whole country, you know, migration we do it by choice. So because of that, we think that we should focus on empowerment. And also try very hard to bring in women from the community to change their perception, their way of thinking, like everything belongs to The more we have more images that I am speaking. Hello. Hi. Um, Lucy, we're still having some trouble hearing you. I think the connection is uh, not uh, in our favor today. But um, yes. Okay, I will, um, for now, Lucy, I think you can. Um, hold so your where did I there. Stop? Hello? Yes. We can hold your thought there. I will come back to you uh, in a moment. Maybe we can see if the connection gets a little bit better. Uh, so for now, I can yes. ask I can ask the next speaker to join. Um, but thank you so much, Lucy. I appreciate you um, sharing some of your thoughts with us. Uh, I will move on to uh, Eileen Lam and I'll introduce her first. So Eileen Lam is an activist, community organizer, educator, and human rights defender. She has devoted herself to the human rights and social justice movement for over 20 years. Uh, she's the founder of Butterfly, an Asian and migrant sex worker support network, and has used diverse and innovative approaches to advocate social justice for migrant sex workers, for example, leadership building and community mobilization. She has made transformative contributions to the migrant sex workers movement in Canada by being a unique and compelling player in sex workers' rights, migrant justice, labor rights, and gender justice circles. Uh, so with that, I want to ask uh, Alina as well to join us in talking about what changes we want to see in the arena of labor migration and the examples of where this is already happening. So Alina, the floor is yours. Thank you. So thank you for inviting me. And I'm so glad that um, we have chance not only talk about the problem, not only talk about the challenge, but today we are talk about our vision and talking about our dream. And this is so amazing. So many people come together. And I think no matter how much challenge, we need to still have our hope, our, our dream, and then our vision to bring the change. And I think this is amazing. And thank you for organizing. And I really see a lot of beautiful people doing a lot of great work for many, many years. And so, and I think that we need to be um, celebrate like the, for, for, for this, like have so many powerful people come together and, and continues working with the community to bring the change in. And so uh, for Butterfly as an Asian and migrant sex worker organization, I think the most important thing uh, um, for sex worker community is recognize sex work as work. So, and sex work should be see as a labor issue instead of seeing sex work as a violence. So um, it is really great that uh, GetW and many um, people here is really believe that. And unfortunately we see that many people, I don't call them feminists because they love police more than the sex worker and women, but some particularly in culture and feminists, they keep asking more policing, they are asking more rescue, they are asking more control uh, of the woman body. At the end, it's not about the rights of the sex worker, it's about the control of woman body, they should not sell the sex. So that is something we really, really want to see the change. And this is something uh, Butterfly and many uh, sex worker organizations have been doing to organize the worker to speak out. And we also need to see that sex work is very powerful way to resist many kinds of 
oppression and particularly by migration, people can you know resist like for example age right so and and we see many women when they come to Canada so that they can have different identity and they can also use different way to present the age to resist the ageism right and so also the trans sex workers so because they're being discriminated in the job market so sex work is the alternative um income as migrant, there is very limited working opportunity because of language barrier, because of the very bad working conditions. So, for example, in Canada, I think in many countries, if you are the migrant worker, you only earn money <laughs> lower. <laughs> you have very long working time, but okay. a sex worker actually can earn more money. But also, instead of just um uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 being isolated, sex worker can work together with other sex worker that is amazing important uh, community building and also get so much social resources and i think this is so important we need to see that so we should not see criminal law we should not see migrant control as the way to address the issue sex worker face is the discrimination is the criminalization is the migrant control that makes sex worker be vulnerable so that's why we really hope that um we will continue to fight and and we really want to see sex work is not only the sex worker movement but also um involved in the labor movement so other labor organization would also recognize sex work as work and also um recognize sex work as the member of their community so and the other thing uh, butterfly is also building the solidarity with other migrant group so and particularly in canada we have a status for all campaigns so um two weeks before so like uh, a thousand workers just do a protest in ottawa and i think this is amazing that different migrant group can also come together to fight together and the other big piece is really um we see migrant racialized people and sex worker is um facing a lot of different oppression including racism including anti-migrant, including like um, uh, uh, policing, so that how to build the solidarity between different movements. So um, instead of having them see sex worker and migrant women as their allies, they need to support, they really need to include migrant movement in their movement. So when you talk about gender-based violence, that you need to include the migrant rights perspective, you need to include the anti-racism perspective, you need to include the sex worker rights perspective. So we really hope to see the solidarity between the sex worker, migrant, labor, gender justice, and also all different movements, and then fight together and make our dream come true. So thank you. Thank you so much, Aline, and thank you for also pointing out that or making that very important point about solidarity across movements. I think it was also something that we discussed in the last session um, that uh, speaking on behalf of or talking about gender justice uh, isn't complete if you're not talking about migrant rights and definitely migrant sex worker rights as well. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I'll then invite our, our next speaker, who is uh, Alejandra Anchita. So uh, introduction to Alejandra. Alejandra is the founder and executive director of PRODESC, uh, which is a Mexican intersectional feminist human rights defense organization that was founded in 2005, um, and it has a transnational reach. So since it was founded, Alejandra and her team have led uh, processes to protect economic, social, and cultural rights, achieving unprecedented results such as the application of business accountability mechanisms. Um, and due to the impact of her work, she has received the Martin Annalds Award in 2014 and in 2015, and was publicly recognized by the Mexican Senate for her uh, ongoing uh, work uh, to defend human rights. She has published several articles on the issue of human rights, power dynamics between human rights defenders, um, and energy transition with respect to human rights, among others. She is currently a member of the academic board of the law faculties at the Universidad Iberoamericana Ciudad de Mexico and the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana in Mexico as well, um, is a board member of the Benavera Institute of Human Rights, a member of the Global Reference Group and uh, a member of the Martin Ennals Foundation Board as well. Um, 
And yes, with that, I will uh, pose the same question to uh, Alejandra about what changes we want to see in the arena of labor migration as feminists and um, examples of where we already see this happening. So thank you again, Alejandra, for joining us and I will give you the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Marianne. And um, well, I, I obviously prepare uh, different answers for this, this conversation. And during the time that we were we were sharing the, the reflection with, with our, my colleagues in the beginning of the conversation, um, I was thinking like I had to change my, my presentation because ev every one of them were just making very powerful points about how to think labor migration in a feminist world. And, and I will try to integrate some of the, the, the questions, uh, some of the answers. But first, I would like to, to thank to the colleagues from the Global Alliance Against Trafficking Women for the invitation to discuss um, this very important topic. Um, also, thank you for for the people that are, are together with us and the other panelists, Lucy and, and Helene. And I would like to say that the first change uh, that seems obvious, at least for me and the organization that I am directing is, is also fundamental. And um, my colleagues during the, the the small group were also uh, pointing out uh, that uh, we need to, to really incorporate the perspective of labor migration um, understanding that all migrants are workers and as such must have their labor human rights guarantee. Um, however, of the reason why they migrated. Um, Unfortunately, the, the mainstream narratives from the global north do not focus on this. Uh, the left of addressing, uh, the left, I'm sorry, the left addresses the humanitarian side of the migration. Um, Natividad Oveso was, was saying in the small group that during the pandemic, she's hearing more and more how important is migration and uh, from the governments, the media and the organizations, academics, but um, they are not necessarily fulfilling uh, the human rights of migrant people. No? And they are sometimes trying to provide shelter and food to people in desperate need but right now in the pandemic, um, that is not even what is happening. And the other element that my colleagues also were saying and, and Helene was pointing out was um, how the, the migration is still an illegal issue that um, in some countries, principally in the global north, uh, could destroy their, their societies and also the labor market. So to resolve the main causes of migration, governments in the global north are encouraging the implementation of temporary labor migration programs, no? at least in some regions of, of the world. And these programs allow people from the global south to go to work in countries in the global north for a specific period of time without the possibility of temporary, for temporary or permanent residence. Um, here in Mexico, we have a clear example um, that these programs are not implemented to favor temporary migrant workers' rights, but rather the profit from transnational corporations who benefit from cheap labor. These workers that in the case of the USA have to apply for H2A and H2B visas endure human rights violations both in 
their country in Mexico and also in the country of destination, in this case, the United States. Women particularly suffer harassment, sexual abuse, and threats directed to them and their families. And in the USA, women are paid less than men for doing the same physically demanding job. And the ILO has reported that worldwide women migrants are paid less than men migrants for the same work. Um, another change that I would like to see is the open discussion about responsibility. We, are, we, were, we, were, talking, we were talking about how important it is to understand the environment of discrimination in the, the different countries that are receiving migrants and how that discrimination is also focused in not understanding that migrant people is, and specifically women that are migrating have human rights and labor rights are part of those rights. So that is the first change that we would like to see. The second is talking about responsibility and responsibility not only from the governments and the states. We would like to understand the responsibility that corporations have also to respect human rights and the obligation that they have to repair and remediate when their actions lead to human rights violations. Corporations already know that human rights violations happen in their product and also uh, in in their labor supply chains. However, they are not being held accountable and that, that has to change. For us as PRODES, as an organization of human rights, one of the, the examples that are, are successful is uh, the work that we had been developing for more than nine years with temporary workers, Mexican workers that are traveling to the US behind the H2A and, and H2B visas that were facing for several years all those violations that I was describing and also the violations that my colleagues described before. And in that regards, they were supported by PRODESC, by the organization that I am directed, in order to, to create a collective uh, body for demanding their labor rights and their human rights and they create the coalition of temporary mi migrant workers in Mexico, composed of Mexican workers who travel to the US. And the coalition is the only group in Mexico that gathers temporary migrant workers to advocate for their rights and to provide services to, to fellow temporary migrant workers. In 2018, the, co the coalition also opened its first worker center in Northern Mexico where they provide useful information to avoid frauds and illegal recruitment fees. Women and women's rights are also the center of the coalition and most of its spokesperson are women. With Ally US organization that is also implements the radar, the radar program, which uh, once employer warns employers in the US when they are credible complaints that a recruiter has been violating labor rights, human rights, and calls for the employers to stop. If the employer continues using the same recruiter who violates human rights, then under the US law, the employer is jointly liable and can be sued in the United States. So what I am trying to, to say is, we can see some of the answers for the issues that migrant women and uh, migrant workers are facing for, of course, is part of what uh, my colleagues were saying. We, we need to keep pushing for recognition, for equality, for rights. Uh, we need to, be, to focus or to center in our campaigns, the perspective of migrants, not the perspective of corporations or governments. And we, we believe that collective organization is still a very important tool for, for demanding uh, labor rights and human rights. 
And we also believe that we need, no matter what industry or what space of work migrant workers are developing for the work, we need to understand the role of industries and corporations in maintaining this system of exploitation for all the migrant workers. Doesn't matter if are sex workers or temporary workers or um, workers uh, in the high tech industry or workers that are just crossing in the undocumented way. The, the ones who are always benefit for this uh, migration, labor migration, are not only the states, but principally corporations and industries. And we need to be better organized to focus those actors as, uh, as, as the actors that we need to push. Our organizations, collective organization, demanding uh, collective uh, contracts, demanding improving of um, labor conditions and also demanding from the governments safe uh, conditions for traveling and migrating. So yeah, I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alejandra. And um, I actually really like that you shared that, that you know, you initially had a presentation prepared, but it sort of changed based on the conversations we had here. And I think that's a, that's a really good thing. I think that tells us that we're all sort of, you know, brainstorming together and also learning from each other. And um, I, so I appreciate that you, you shared that with us. And I also really like that you uh, mentioned responsibility, the responsibility of actors and particularly corporate actors, because um, that plays a huge part in, uh, first of all, where migrant workers are, are going to and also the access that corporate actors are having to all these different countries and, and the fact that most of the times, you know, they are kind of exempt, almost exempt from, from the laws and, and uh, labor laws that govern the, the country. So thank you for mentioning that as well. Um, and with that, I want us to take, I think it's time for us to take a short break, just a short five minute break to kind of refresh, take a sip of water, stretch, do what we need to do, and then we can get back and we'll continue with our second question for our speakers. Uh, and then we'll move on to uh, the next part of the agenda. So thank you all and uh, see you in five minutes. I'll play a song for us. Uh, hopefully it can be heard, but once I turn it off, we can all come back into the room. Yeah. I think we can get back um, slowly from our break. And uh, just to remind everyone, in case anyone has just joined us, uh, welcome back. Um, I'm not sure if I introduced myself before, but my name is Marianne, and I work with the Association for Women's Rights and Development, uh, that's AWID. And we are co-organizing this webinar series entitled Feminist Fridays, Conversations About Labor Migration from a Feminist Lens with uh, GAD W, uh, as well as uh, Focus on Labor Exploitation, FLEX. And we also have Solidarity Center and the Women in Migration Network uh, co-organizing this with us. So we have just gone through a first round of, question, of um, questions with the panelists where we talked about changes we want to see in the arena of labor migration. So our second question, or my second question for our speakers is, what can we do to make our visions a reality? Um, and what power do we have? And what gives us hope? Um, I will invite uh, Lucy to speak uh, first. And because we were we had some trouble earlier with connection, Lucy, I, you can finish off your first thoughts and transition to the second question uh, as you see best. And if we have, if we continue to have audio trouble, I will let you know, and then we can move on to the second speaker and see how we can uh, resolve that. So Lucy, you can uh, get started. I'm not sure if we have Lucy back. 
Okay, I don't think we do. Um, so, okay, I'll transition into um, Aline. So, uh, Aline, my question to you is, uh, earlier you spoke about uh, Butterfly and about the work of- Hello. Uh, hi, Lucy. How are you, Maria? I'm, I'm sorry good. we have, yeah. I'm sorry we have bad network. Okay. That's all right. Uh, are you are you okay to speak now? So my question to you was, uh, what can we do to make our vision a reality? Uh, what power do we have and what gives us hope? And I know you got cut off earlier when you were still sharing your thoughts about the first question. So you can finish your thoughts and then also tell us a bit about the second question. So feel free okay. To mm. I say that my thoughts is that I hope that we can abolish the kafala. That was the first, that, that, that was in me because I know what I went through the kafala. Like in some Asian countries, they live by class. We have the first class, we have the second class, we have the third class. And like for us migrant workers, we find ourselves in the last class, which make us to be to them as, we, as if we are not humans. So never, it's also that we walk behind doors. And because we walk behind doors, we are so unable to forced labor. So, so my first vision is that the abolition of the kafala system, because, because it leads to verbal abuse, sexual, and let me say, even it violates human rights. But there is no justice for migrant domestic workers because we are not included in the labor law. This, their system, they are see us as slaves. We are in slavery, have been abolished for a very long time. So my first vision, my first dream is like to abolish the kafala. And the second one is empowerment. I take empowerment because I thought that it's because of hunger, poverty, starvation, that leads to high rate of human trafficking, which also leads to gender-based violence, human rights abuse, and also human rights abuse, and also sexual harassment. So even that is a thing that human traffic, if, if we do not develop in our home countries, it survive, no matter the condition, they need to feed. So coming home back, we use it as an example. As a young organization, we are embarking on skill training. We work on farms. We motivate young women to go to the farm. We train them. We do not only stop there, we go to the street to advocate and also try to prevent women from being from being trafficked or either with traffic again. So because like when they come home, there is nothing like reintegration. Because of there is no reintegration, what they do because of the shame, and there is a philosophy in Africa that say that when you go to this Asian country or either the Europe country, you are going there to make money. So coming home, like, had the trauma in them. Most of them got mentally disordered because of this. So like, we think like, oh my God, we do not only have to come and see, but we have to organize ourselves as women because we know that they took advantage of us because they know that we are human and we are weak. Most time, men always feel that they are stronger than women, they can do anything. So we refuse to say no to silence. We want to keep on the fight. So we hope that we will get empowered in Africa so that if we have jobs in Africa, we can minimize human trafficking. Thank you, I cannot go longer because of the time. Now I go to the uh, second question. Yes, you can go ahead to the second question. Now, the second question is, hello, Maria. Hello. Yes, Lucy, we can still hear you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, can you please repeat the second question? Yes, definitely. 
So the second question is, um, I, in the first one, we were kind of listing what we want to see change, what, what we want to, uh, you were mentioning abolishing uh, the kafala system. Um, you were mentioning the work of the domestic workers uh, advocacy network. So the second question is kind of what do we do to make these visions a reality and, and what power do we have uh, to do this? First of all, I start with the power. Women have power to transform communities. Women has power to change. So like, because we have that power in we, we start with, I start with that question. Because like, I want to give an example. If you, if like you marry, you bring a woman to your home, that woman will change that to a home and later it will change it to a family and the family will turn to a community. So because of that, because of that, we say that women are very good to make change because we can advocate very well and like we are polite and we have all the strategies to bring ourselves together. And when we bring ourselves together, we can, and, and when we unite, believe me, women can change the world within a minute. Then I come to the second question, which says that, Hello? Yes, yes, Lucy. Yeah, I'm looking for... So the second part of that question was kind of what gives us hope? What gives us hope in, um, in making these changes and these visions? Okay, what gives us hope? What so, gives us hope? Yeah, so I think you you actually touched on it as well when you were talking about um, the work that women. No, I want to, I want to answer the first one. Yeah, oh, I sure. want to answer the first one. Then I last the word give us hope. Yeah, you're welcome to go ahead. Okay, now we said what we can do to see that our vision come reality. First of all, we should say no to silence, because I know the type of humiliation that I went through the Middle East when I stand out to speak for my fellow women, like they would say like they would delete me, they would say, so as women, we should say no to silence. That was the first thing. The second thing, we should encourage women to take up a career. And we should not always, and we should not also encourage them to only take that, but we should what? We should help them to pursue their dreams. If we, like Lenny said, when we come home, if, we, if, we, if like a woman said, I want to become a farmer, we provide ceilings, we provide trainings, we ask for communities to provide land. So we should do that. And also we should engage women. We should talk to them by what? By changing some of their beliefs because we have some beliefs in Africa that schools are not for women. All women should go to the Bondo society. We have all these, and we are we we are we are starting to believe that when 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 men see as a woman you should not stand and pass by you should bow your head women uh, women should not involve in national issues women should not involve in national rights so all these things as as young feminists we need to go to communities we need to talk to these people we need to change their belief we need to talk to them we need to tell them that no we have to involve in national issues. We have to involve in making laws. We have to involve in whatever decision in our community, not like in Africa, like they said, uh, uh, we, uh, we, we will answer for the women, they are behind cooking. We, women should no longer start, uh, sit behind for preparing food. We should involve in, in uh, uh, ourselves in decision making because whenever a woman takes a decision, it's covered for the whole world. So because Because of that, these are some of the policies I'm about. Gender-based violence, because like many responsibilities, when we teach them about their rights and responsibilities, then they can know what to do or what not to do. But like, if we leave them, only they are going with this perception 
like the, the, the it, it, like in Sierra Leone, if 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 a if a man beat his wife, then they will say it's responsible for that. But we should look at. We should always try to raise our voice up there. Not only you say it in your country, but you should do something that the international body will look at. And we should try to work in groups, work togetherness, try to draw in more partners. By so doing, I think our vision will become reality. Now I come to the last question. I'm sorry. I uh Thank you. The Thank last you, question. Hello. Yes. I think uh, Lucy, okay. because of because of time, I might have to stop you there. But I will. You will have more time to share because uh, we'll have question and answers, and I can already see some questions coming in. So if it's okay. Okay, with you, Maria. Will... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. <laughs> um, but I really appreciate you sharing, and I think you made a very important point about uh, decision making and the, the the power of being involved in decision making and at all levels, at all levels of, uh, of the state. And that's a really, really important point um, among all the, all the others that you made. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, I will turn to Aline now to answer the same question about uh, making our vision a reality and uh, what power we have and what gives us hope. Uh, so Aline, you're welcome to share some thoughts as well. Yeah, it is really my honor to be on the same, like uh, speak together with other speakers. So it's amazing. Thank you, Lucy, for this powerful, important voice, you know, that like she keeps saying, we need to keep fighting, not to be weak and should not be silenced. And, and then how to involve in that political process. And I think this is so important. And I think I totally agree. That should be something is our vision we continue to do. Um, so, and I think, that I still remember I was in the movement for 20 years. And I think this is so challenging because you may see you need to spend so much years to fight that little bit, but can be pushed back so quickly, right? So, and we can see little protection of the migrant law, little re respect of uh, women. So, but when something happened like pandemic, we see how the government increased the power imposing stronger migrant control and also blaming the, the migrant continues to exploit the, the migrant worker and how to continue to benefit the ruling class. And we also see how the right wing races anti-migrant groups is getting more and more power, more and more influence in the political you know, expect and to, to, to stop us from fighting. And it is really hard and sad to see that, but how we can keep ourselves to have that vision and dream. I remember when I was in Thailand, I met the friends from Empower. They told me that, so it is so difficult. Even we need to fight 100 year. We need to remind ourselves we are having one day closer to our goal. So, and I think that no matter what happened, we still need to continue to fight. And I totally agree with uh, both speaker, the importance of the voice of the community, right? And I think because many, many voices and description about migrant sex worker and migrant worker is about how they are victimized, how they are vulnerable, how they are weak. So we see how the system oppress the people, make people, be vulnerable, but we really need to recognize that is amazing, strong, powerful woman that is chasing the dream and fighting every day in different level. And we also see that many politicians and many anti-migrant group or some safer, white safer group that they pretend that care about that, but they just use it to further abuse or control of the group and then that the, they, they use the victim would you know to continues to impose the oppression so that's why i think it's so important that how we continue to speak out continues to organize to speak out the beautiful side the powerful side and of migration why we call the name butterfly because it's no matter how you put the border 
you can stop butterfly flying everywhere. People think that the insect eating the leaf is the bad animal, just like the, how they describe migrants. But if no butterfly, our world would disappear. They are still beautiful and every butterfly is unique. And so, and I think this is a symbolic thing that we also want to continue to embrace the power of the migrant worker, no matter in which sector, how they are beautiful, how they um, continues to fight to support themselves and family and how they really um, pursue the dream, right? Some people migrant is because they just want to survive, have more income. Some people may do it is because they really want to have an adventure no matter what reason that we need to support it. And why migrant become vulnerable actually is the systematic, is the migrant law take away the people right. It's because of the racism, discrimination that is make the migrant continues can be exploited by the state, right? It's not only individual, it's the state. So, and I think that pushing status for all, pushing free migration, pushing like anti-racism, this is very, very uh, important. And so, and, and I think this is our power, right? So that like we are together, we are together, we have the common, but we are also different and that solidarity and beautiful, is very, very important. And I think the other big piece we really need to, um, we know that how religion group and some of the feminist group, they are also very, very influential and politically, but particularly for sex worker and many migrants, they are not really friendly. And some of them actually, they may have good intentions, some no, but some may. And I think how they need to really listen to the voice of the migrant and be the real allies and then take away the moral agenda, take away the realistic agenda and support rights, not rescue, right? So it's like the right is the best way you give resources, you give rights um, when migrant can assess, that is powerful. And the other big piece, and I think just like GetW and many of you have been doing, how to organize the community power, police, border control, NGO, should not be the safer. And many migrant, particular sex worker we know, police cannot save us. So what we can save us is how we can build the solidarity and build our community power to resist. And one of the example is like, we see many migrant sex worker before because they only know few agents, they may be controlled, but because of the social media, they know this boss is bad and then they know other boss that they may can make use of the community support actually to improve the, the condition and situation and how we continue to support the community power are using um, innovative way, creative way. And, and I think now have more and more people concerned about defund police movement and also abolitionist movement and how we really, and particularly that they are led by the women of color and trans people so that how we can learn and work together so to build the alternative that how um, can advocate the rights and, and address all the issues faced uh, by migrant sex workers. Uh, and I also hope that we continue to have this kind of gathering and sharing. And we really hope that to see the, um, uh, the, the migrants should have right to assess different resources, support, and also continues to have the right to migrate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eileen. Um, you made some very, very important points. Uh, I really like that you sh sh like stated clearly that migrants are vulnerable because of the laws that exist and the systems that exist now and the racism that exists now. That's, that's what makes them vulnerable as opposed to the fact that they actually chose to move. Um, and so unless we change those systems, we, we can't really keep talking about vulnerability and do nothing about it. Um, and definitely uh, your point about feminist groups and religious groups needing to be allies and moving away from that moralistic agenda is very, very important. Um, and I think, you know, pointing out as well that the NGOs and the police should not be our saviors because a lot of the time the work is actually done by communities themselves. It's, it's, uh, it starts off in communities, it's done by communities. So that's uh, really, really important to point out as well. Um, and last but not least, I'll invite you, Alejandra, to also share your thoughts on making our visions a reality and uh, the power we have and what gives us hope. Thank you. 
Thank you, Marianne. And thank you again to, 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 to Lucy and Helen for, for the powerful reflection, no? And, and I would like to also um, celebrate that we are talking about power, no? And not only about uh, vulnerability. Which is which is a huge step from from us and our agenda, and in trying to respond to the the second question, um, I would like to say that I I always always find hope in the construction of collective power, no, and the the fact that uh, in the case and the example that I was sharing with all of you, temporary migrant workers uh, facing human rights violation. Uh, can organize themselves and also demand the rights and also achieve justice, of course, uh, gives me hope to that change is possible, even with the, the legal structure that we have. No? And that is probably um, some of the, the uses that lawyers uh, on litigating and human rights we can we can share with with social movements with migrant and labor movements how even with the laws we can use the law in a in a critical way in order to 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 push um, the structure for the collective power that migrant workers are are building by themselves. So that gives me hope. Um, for the coalition, uh, for example, uh, this means re reaching out to different workers in Mexico also, supporting more temporary migrant workers uh, uh, to avoid frauds and illegal recruitment fees, and supporting the, the construction of more worker centers to protect migrant workers. Um, the the final goal is to build an ethical recruitment system. Um, for that, we need lots of voices to push for this agenda. And I think that is 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 very similar to uh, to what Lucy and and Eileen were also sharing. No, um, we need to to support. Uh, migrant workers uh, from their their own communities, from their own necessities, and um, the best way to to do it is also identifying, in an ethical perspective, what is our power as human rights organizations, or uh, unions, labor unions, or fund foundations, for example, no. Um, one of the points of Natividad Obeso was how difficult it is for, for migrant workers, women migrant workers, to, to be always the object of academics or civil society organizations or um, politicians. Uh, and this way of extractivism that some human rights organization and some foundations and some politicians are developing um, for be part of the, the 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 response for migrant workers is is something that we have to change. We have to acknowledge the power dynamics that we we develop among the movement, and we have to challenge also. The, the concept of solidarity. You know, what means solidarity when we are recognizing power dynamics and inequality, even among of allies? And I think that is a, an important point to, to keep in our minds, in our discussions and in our reflections. Uh, but um, in, our, in my experience, the answer for, for changing the situation is still uh, building collective power, supporting 
the demands and the vision of migrant workers. And um, also supporting the understanding of other actors of the society about the power dynamics and not only about the vulnerability of um, migrant workers and um, migrant um, women. No? Um, related to that, for us, it's still a very important using the law and using the, the, the tools for litigate against the violations of human rights as human rights organizations using the local legal system to try to protect the rights of migrant people, migrant workers, but at the same time, um, bringing to the local uh, strategies for litigate and to and for amplify the, the frame of protection of migrant workers. At the same time, we also are still pushing for um, bringing the transnational perspective of what is happening with migrant workers in our country is happening also in other parts of the world. The, the patterns of violation, discrimination, and oppression are almost the same. And the, the actors that have to be involved in the change that migrant workers are pushing, again, are the states, but also corporations. And um, that, is, that is part of the, the, the vision and the, the, the answer that we are trying to, to build. I, I really appreciate the, the conversation with Lucy and Ellen, and principally because they, they, were, they were also setting on the table um, power dynamics between allies, no? and, and how some organizations are uh, using in a bad way the, the needs of migrant people. And we need to, to address that discussion and we need to address the perspective that Ellen was also reaching out related to, it is, it is about rights, not about rescue, no? And, and that is also the change that I would like to see. Uh, I would like to see uh, the, the possibility to, to understand the role that we are playing in, in, the whole, in the whole ecosystem. I would like to see how social movements as women, uh, migrants, workers, or other social movements are the ones who are leading and setting the agenda and how human rights defenders as me and my colleagues at Prodesk can use our expertise to support the agenda of social movements and not in the way that um, it is happening in, with some organizations. No? So that is also my hope. And I think with, with more collective organization that will be possible and, and we need to, to keep pushing for, for a vision of rights and not a vision of rescuing or not only centering the vulnerability of people, but principally centering the power, the collective power of people, principally of women and um, migrant workers. So, I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alejandra. Um, I, I really uh, appreciate your points as well. Um, definitely bringing up the, the law and the way that it can be used to support, uh, critically support migrant workers. And I think it's important to highlight that there's kind of different ways to tackle the same problem and litigation is, is an important one for sure. Um, and really, uh, 
the support supporting the construction of more worker centers, building an ethical recruitment system, all of those are very important as well. And um, and I, I think it's also uh, great that you point out that there's a need to use the local legal systems as well to support, uh, try and support workers' rights. And actually, one of the questions that came up in the chat, um, though we don't have too much time, I'm seeing that one question that did come up in the chat was, how uh, how can we organize uh, women workers in their in a country of destination when movement is very restricted? And that is quite tricky. Um, and uh, maybe, I, I don't know if Alandrahandra, you have some way to speak to that since you do work with uh, temporary migrant workers. If I can pass that question to you. Thank you, Marianne. Yes, I, I, I think the, the, the local responses or the local answers are more than ever very important. No? We have the tendency to, to set the, the answers um, in the international arena, which is, is, is useful and it is part of a, a bigger strategy, but in our experience, what is really working is um, the possibility to give uh, a safe space to migrant workers in the local context. And I was explaining one of the examples that we were supporting is, is this coalition of temporary migrant workers, Mexican workers that are traveling to the US to, to work in seasons. And they, they believe for decades that they were not able to be organized because in the US, they don't have the right to be collective organized and they don't consider themselves workers in Mexico because they were working in the United States. So part of the work that we were able to do with them was identifying that they were workers, even when they were developing their work in the United States, they were workers already in Mexico. And uh, in, that, in that way, using the law, for example, again, in the Mexican law, there is there is a, a figure which is the coalition, and the coalition doesn't necessarily requires the same requirements for create a union, which is more difficult, but gives the opportunity to to collectively or be organized as workers and also a demand and negotiate with employers, but at the same time with the with the government, and we use that that a figure, legal figure, to, to um, give the workers the possibility to, to demand rights from the Mexican government and also to demand rights from, from the employers at the, at the US. And that was very powerful, but that started with a very small community in the state of Sinaloa uh, in, in Topolobampo with small meetings, with workshops, with uh, visiting the houses of the workers, working with the organizers that are also temporary workers. I mean, it is, it is a lot of local work, which is important to underline because some of the answers that we are envisioning can, can be seen as, well, we, we can do it. No, and, and it is very big, and, but we can do it. But in order to really reach all those goals, we really need to work at the local, uh, with the bases, within the base, and create a safe space. Whatever that means, in our experience, that is creating a collective safe space uh, among workers and creating also a a trust relationship with the workers and the organization that I am direct, directing, where we can talk about power dynamics and where we can talk about what is our role as their lawyers and what is the, the role that they have as, as the leaders from the movement. And the second part was once they were um, safe enough to demand the rights, as coalition, they were winning some, some rights with the government and we were also winning some cases. It was not easy, I'm just making a summary of the, of the years of work. 
And then the answer from the workers was, we need to create a safe space for other workers. And they created this worker center, which is based in this small town. When, and in this um, worker center, they are also uh, advising other workers on the issues that they already know, and they can avoid uh, bigger violations. And that is that is a part of the answer. And now, as coalition, they are they are reaching out other workers in 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 the country, and they are creating committees, which are also part of the coalition, because they want to do this coalition a national coalition of migrant workers that have the enough collective power to negotiate with the Mexican government, but also to negotiate with employers in the United States. And the, the, this, the, the next step is that they wanted to create other two worker centers that can build what they, they envision as a corridor of dignity for migrant workers that will start in the south of Mexico, will continue in the center of Mexico, and they have already that the other worker center in the north of Mexico. Thinking again in what need to do is create the sense of be safe. And migrant workers and migrant people, what are facing is all this violence during the, the, the traveling and the worker centers will attend temporary workers or migrant workers or workers from the communities. Doesn't matter if they are migrating with visa or not. That is not a question. It is a question of they are workers and they need to be in a safe space. They need to have trainings or whatever they need to achieve for make uh, pos the possibility of migrate, of labor migration, a uh, possibility um, fulfill of rights and not necessarily fulfill of violence. No? So in our experience, local organization is one huge part of the answer and, and supporting the, the agenda of the workers is also um, the other part of the answer, not necessarily imposing our agenda or the agenda of the foundations. With this, the reality, the foundations are also pushing for the agenda. And Prodesk, I can tell you, have to reject, reject some grants because we don't want to, to work under the agenda of some foundations that are not necessarily the same agenda of the workers. That is not useful for us. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. And I think from what we've heard from Lucy and from what we've heard from Medina as well, the agenda is already being set and has already been set by the communities themselves and by the migrant workers themselves. Um, so I really, really appreciate Alejandra for, for that answer and for your contribution, as well as uh, to Eileen and to Lucy. Unfortunately, because of time, we find ourselves not being able to have a, a more uh, open discussion with, with our participants. But I will ask everyone to uh, take a moment to fill in. So I've shared a link to our Jamboard. And if you slide through past the, the space for breakout groups, there was also a question there about what would you change about the arena of labor migration as it stands now? Uh, so this could be decision-making, this could be around policies, it could be around institutions, and what visions do we want to bring to the world? So, so similar to the questions that we've asked the panelists, we also want to hear from participants, um, and though we don't get to hear from, uh, from you in, in the plenary, as, as we had hoped, Although it's it's for a good reason, I think we we use the time to to hear from our really wonderful speakers, and we also had some time to connect in the breakout rooms, which was really important. Uh, we can also just leave some of our thoughts uh, in the Jamboard, um, and I think because we are at time, we will uh, we'll trust that 
folks will just uh, post their answers in there. There's uh, no specific time limit. Just feel free to drop some thoughts in there and uh, we can uh, wrap up. So thank you again to, to all our speakers. Thank you so much to Eileen. Thank you so much to Lucy and thank you so much to Alejandra. We've had some really uh, inspiring conversations today. We've had um, some great visions coming out to light. I think we've had space to imagine, we've had space to dream, but we've also been able to see some real real life examples of this work actually being done. And um, we've actually heard from people who are saying that this, this is possible. All of these things that we're talking about are possible. Um, and so I just want to thank you for that. And uh, I of course want to thank the co-organizers, uh, of course, Cat W for, for making this all possible, for inviting us and bringing the space here to uh, a Women in Migration Network, to Solidarity Center, to FLEX as well uh, for co-organizing this and to, to everyone who was able to make this possible, to our interpreters, uh, to everyone who was uh, supporting in the, in the facilitation, to everyone at GetW also who helped manage the space, Chris, Bobby, everyone, uh, Bandana, everyone. We're so grateful to you all. And uh, with that, we will wrap up the sixth se session of Feminist Fridays. And as always, recordings are available on the GATW page, but also when you registered, you got an email that shared all the links for uh, the past session. So you'll get to see that as well as this session. So uh, yes, thank you. Thank you again. And have an amazing day, evening, wherever you're based. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you all. Thank Gracias. you. Bye bye. Gracias. Bye. bye. Abrazos, abrazos a todas. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Kati. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Kati. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good night. <laughs> bye. Hey. God bless. More power to us. Right centered. We really have to organize. It's more, ah, oh, sorry. It's more organization. And